So this is a, a talk about Constable Country um, and in particular a virtual tour of Constable Country and we're going to be having a look at some of the highlights. We'll stop off at some of the places that Constable painted, so we'll have a look. Now I know that it's, um, you know, for many of you this is going to be quite familiar territory and I'm, I'm sure you've all been to Constable Country many times. Um, but I don't know about you, but I, I never tire of, um, of actually visiting country, you know, going to Dedham, going to Flatford. Um, and although we've got a few time constraints tonight, so we won't be able to talk about everything I'd like to, hopefully you'll find it of interest and hopefully I can whet your appetite so that you may want to go there yourself again, maybe this summer. So we're going to start off with our, our first slide. I can just move on. So we're going to start here um, with just talking briefly about John Constable himself. Now John Constable was born in 1776 at East Burgholt and, um, and he died when he was 61 years old in 1837 and he was the son of Golding Constable and his mother was Anne as you can see here. He was one of six children and um, Golding Constable was a, a flour merchant, corn merchant, uh, he was also a coal merchant. He owned Flatford Mill, Dedham Mill. Um, he had a boat building yard and he also owned some seagoing um, boats as well. And um, it was it was Golding's ambition initially, I think, that John would actually enter the church. But he he didn't really he wasn't really keen on that. So the next option was for John to join him in the milling business. Now, of course, John wasn't too keen on this. He was much too interested in painting. Um, and eventually, by the time, you know, when John was in his early 20s, um, and by that time, his younger brother, Abram, had joined his father in the milling business. And it was then that his father gave John a small allowance, which allowed him to go and study art at the Royal Academy. Now, when we talk about Constable Country, it's, um, it, it's reckoned that probably Constable Country was probably about eight or nine miles in any direction from East Burgholt where John Constable lived. So this is the distance that he could have walked or maybe gone on horseback in all directions, sketching, painting, um, and the like. Now, we're only gonna talk about three areas this evening. We're gonna talk about East Burgholt, Flatford Mill, and Dedham. So they're the three areas we're gonna look at. And over the years, um, you know, 25, 30 years maybe, I've been working as a tour guide on and off at Flatford and Constable Country. And whether I'm taking a, a small group or even a coach load of people there, I tend to go in a certain order. So I normally go to Flatford first, then East Burgholt, and then I finish up at Dedham. I'm going to do the same little um, thing tonight. So we start from Flatford. Various ways you can get to Flatford, of course. You could go by train to Manning Tree and walk along the footpath. You could walk from Dedham along the river to get to Flatford. But most people probably would drive to Flatford and park in the car park. And if you do that, you'll come down um, into the Flatford area. And by the way, um, Flatford itself, there, there has never been a parish called Flatford. Flatford is a, a small hamlet in East Burgholt, if you like. And there's only about seven or so buildings in Flatford. And virtually all of those now are owned by the National Trust. But as you come down, you'll, you'll come down to what is this bridge cottage. And if you go to the left, on the footpath on the left, that will take you up to where the Haywain was painted, for example, which and Flatford Mill. We'll have a look at that in a moment. Or if you go over the bridge, you're going over into Essex, because we're in Suffolk on this side. The River Stour, for most of its length, is the border between the two counties. So if you go over the bridge, you'll go into Essex and we'll have a look at that in a moment as well. Bridge Cottage has been, has had quite a, a few different uses over the years. Um, uh, some time ago, it was a little cafe and tea room. Um, then it became a John Constable painting exhibition center. And what they've done nowadays, they have furnished it as it would have been probably in mid Victorian period. Um, an interesting image um, of Bridge Cottage is this one. This was Bridge Cottage in 1899 when it was divided into two. Now, if you count these people up, there's, there's 10 people there. So, you, you know, all they had, each family had one little parlour 
and one little attic bedroom with a little ladder sort of stair to go up. So this was in, in 1899. But we're going to take that footpath along to the left. And what you'll do, you'll go past the little National Trust shop. There's a nice big tea room they've made now. And the first site that you come to, not very far along there, is one of John Constable's sites for his painting. And this was called Boat Building, which he did this in 1814. And it's a little dry dock. This was owned by John Constable's father. And this is where he used to build these barges, or they used to call them lighters, but we'll call them barges um, this evening. And this was one of the only paintings that Constable produced entirely in the open air from start to finish. Well, I mean, some of his large six footers, he would paint almost entirely in his London studios from sketches that he'd done over the summer months while he was down in Suffolk. Or sometimes he would start an oil painting in the open air and finish it off in his studios. But this one was completely painted outside and it shows um, a barge. Um, being built there's there's some people here there's some tools lying around if you look carefully i'm not sure if you can see it but there's a horse on the other bank towing this barge this barge has just come through flatford lock and it's gonna he'll uncouple the horse shortly and he's got to go under flatford bridge um this is what it's like now so this is the viewpoint you'll go there now so it's it, it's it's a kind of dry dock that there were plans to actually get a barge actually and put it there for the for the tourist um, market and also of course you can put water in it you can fill it all up now if you want to float your barge and you've got it full of water um, what you do you basically just pull a plug out the other end it's like pulling the plug out your bath and all the water sucks out the plug hole and it goes under a pipe goes through a pipe which runs under the river so the pipe runs right under the river and it goes into a ditch on the far side and when they want to flood it again they take these planks up let the water come in then put the put the planks back again so it, it shows you on this illustration here look so there's the the dock there's the dry dock there's the plug so to empty it you pull the plug out and it runs under this pipe here look and goes into this ditch if, if you go on the other side of the river and you you don't mind going down a little grassy bank you can see the outflow of that pipe um, still going into one of the ditches. If you, while you're at the boat building, if you, if you walk over to the river and stand right on the edge of the river and look to your right, you'll see um, there's Bridge Cottage, you'll see that, and you'll see the bridge going over from Suffolk into Essex. And this was another site of one of John Constable's paintings. So virtually from the same viewpoint that you, you're looking at now, Constable painted this image. Uh, he called it View on the Stewart, 1822. And you can just about see part of the cottage look. That was the bridge at the time. You can see Dedham Church in the background. It's only, it, it's only about a 20 to 30 minute walk if you want to walk from Flatford up to Dedham along the river. Most of these barges or lighters were towed up the river in pairs, they were joined together. So what they've done here, they've uncoupled two barges They've just come through Flatford Lock and they're going up river. And because the towpath, normally the horses will pull them along the towpath. You can see a horse here. They'll pull them along a towpath. But because there's no towpath going under the bridge, they have to uncouple the horse and the, they have to pole them with poles and push them under the bridge. And then they connect the horses up again afterwards. Now, going back to the little road that we came along. If you keep on going to the end, you'll come to Flatford Mill, which you can see here on your right. And if you look in the distance, um, there's Willie Lott's house. They used to call it Willie Lott's Cottage, but it was officially named a house. It's far too big to be, to be a cottage. Um, as I said earlier, most of the buildings at Flatford now are owned by the National Trust, but most of those buildings have been let to the Field Studies Council. And the Field Studies Council um, run courses um, on all sorts of nature subjects and painting, things like this. And if you, if you are a student on one of these courses, then you get to stay maybe in Flatford Mill, or that's where you might do some of your teaching or learning. And Willie Lott's house is used for student accommodation.
So they're not actually open to the public. You can't actually go in there unless you have to go on a on one of their courses. But before we go up to this area, which is where the hay wain was painted, you see this little driveway here. Well, if we just turn left and look through there, we've got this lovely house. This is the oldest building at Flatfoot. It's Valley Farm, um, dates back to the 15th century. And um, this is also now used as student accommodation. But um, apart from this little lean-to on the left, which, which wasn't original, that's pretty much as it was. And this was called a hall house. And it was a hall house because it, it's kind of divided into three. Now, there's the main doorway going in. And when you go into that door, you went into a cross passage. And that cross passage went straight to the rear door. They were lined up. And on the right hand side of that cross passage were two rooms here and they were the service rooms. One was called the pantry, one was the battery. And then you went into the main part of the building, which is the hall. Now the hall was what we might call a, uh, a glorified kitchen come diner, come lounge. That's where everything happened. And the hall, there was no ceiling. The, the, it went right from the floor right up to the rafters. So that's why it was called an open hall. And in the middle of the floor, you'd have a fire. So the fire was in the middle of the floor. You do all your cooking there and you always have all your meals there and so on. And at the left hand side, this end was what they called the high end. And that would be where the parlor, that's where the head of the family would have, have his, um, re, he could have a private room and a little solar come bedroom upstairs. But this is how most, most old timber frame houses were all to, done to a similar design. And I, I've, I've just got it here so you can see it. Um, so this is the floor plan of a hall house. You can see the model on the right. So there's the cross passage. That's the door we could see. Um, and then you've got door to the buttery and a door to the pantry. The pantry is where you'd have dry goods, bread, flour, things like that. Buttery would be milk, drink and, and wet stuff. And then you'd have these little um, pieces here um, just to provide a bit of wind protection. There's, there's, there's called screens, but they were like big oak boards. And then you go into the large hall and there's the fireplace in the middle. And then you can go into the parlor end. And the stairs were often like little ladders in, in, in you know, many cases. Now in the 16th century, it became very fashionable to, to do away with the fireplace in the middle of the floor and put a proper brick chimney in. Because what they wanted to do, rather than have, if you look at the picture on the right, rather than have an open right to the ceiling, because if you want to go, if you was upstairs in this end of the house and you want to go upstairs in this end of the house, you had to come all the way down this ladder, run along here and up that one. So what they did, they put an intermediate floor to make more room, bedrooms upstairs. But of course that meant you couldn't keep the fire on the floor because you'd burn the place down. So they put chimneys in. And one of the favorite places for a chimney was in the cross passage or very close to the cross passage. And if I go back to this one here, you can see where the chimney, in fact, it's slightly off the cross passage here, but you can see what they've done. The, the other option was to put a chimney on the outside wall up this end here, or maybe here. The favorite place was to put it in the cross passage, um, what they've done here or very near to it. And in this uh, illustration, look, you can see the two service rooms. I don't know if you've been down to um, Singleton, the Wheeled and Down and Open Air Museum down near Chichester, but they have got a restored um, uh, farmhouse, open hall house, it's called Bailey Farmhouse, it's been fully restored, there's the door to the cross passage, um, there's the hall, you can see here, look, there's the hall, there's the fire in the middle, and all this smoke would just come up, and at the end here, they have, they have what they call gablets, and there'd be a lot of smoke hood, so the smoke could come out there or there, or it could just filter through the tiles, or it could just come out this window. There'd be a big window like this at the back as well. So if you haven't been there, that's, um, that's really good as well. Now, moving on to the end, um, this is probably the most um, viewed site at Flatford Mill. This is where Constable, this is his viewpoint just here for the Haywain. This was the cart. There's Willie Lott's house. Willie Lott was a, um, a farmer. This was called Gibbons Gate Farm at the time. It does say on his gravestone that he lived here all his life, but I actually think he was born in Valley Farm. The, the, the Lots owned Valley Farm and he took this over later on. But if we want to have a look at the, let's look at the Haywain. 
So this is um, an approximation because in the hay wain, he hasn't got all of this house. He's only got part of it. So if we, we take this image, um, all those trees weren't there. These have all grown up over the years. So in, in Constable's time, he could look over the fields. So this is, this is what the hay wain looks like. So you can actually see it happening. You're actually walking into his pictures almost. There's the hay wain um, painted in 1821. Um, there's part of Willie Lott's house. You can see a little lady here doing some washing. Over here, there's a, a, a man in the rushes there doing some fishing. There's a little dog on the bank here. The little boy is shouting to the dog. And he's probably, he's probably stopped his car in the, in the mill pool here maybe to tighten the wheels up so they sort of expand a bit so they don't um, leak. But if you look over in the distance, um, Constable has marvellous detail. And if you look right over here, you can see people working in the fields. And there's another hay wain, a harvest cart, right over in the background here. And if I just show you, there's a blow up of this bit here. So there's another hay wain being filled. And you can see the workers look, um, getting the harvest in right over in the distance. If you turn round, so we were standing just here at that time looking this way. If you turn round, this is Flatford Mill. There's the mill itself. This is the mill house. And originally there was two water wheels in here. And you can see where the water exited from those water wheels, one there and one there through these culverts, certainly in Constable's time. But in the sort of mid to late Victorian period, they did away with those two wheels and installed a giant wheel, which I'll talk about in a moment, round the back. But um, yeah, this is what it would have looked like. Um, this is a cutaway and you can see the, the two carpets and there's the two wheels that would have been operating on the inside. Now we're going to go back. We're going to go right back to where we started from, um, to the bridge. So this is where there's Bridge Cottage. And it, what we're going to do, we're going to cross over the bridge into Essex now. And we're going to stop just here. So remember this, when you go, stop here, just there. And um, this is another Constable painting you're going to be looking at. Because if, if you look at the, it's not the same bridge, but if you look at the wood from the bridge, and now look on Constable's painting. So there's, that's where we are now. So we're, we're looking down towards Flatford Mill. Unfortunately, there's lots of trees sort of grown up, but, but there's Flatford Mill in the background here. Um, if you follow this footpath, you'll come to the lock, which is just here. And then further along, you get a lovely view of the back of Flatford Mill. But the, and, and along here to the right, just out of view here, is the little ditch I told you about, where the water from the boat building yard comes under the river, under there, and tips into that ditch. That's how they empty the water. But here's Constable's painting look. That's how Constable saw it. And um, again, we've, we've got a, a, a horse is towing this barge. He's gonna obviously uncouple the horse, but he's got to push it under the bridge. There's the little stream look that runs along the back here. That's where they empty the water. You can also see part of, now there's part of Flatford Lock as Constable saw it, but the lock that's there now is built alongside it. So it's a new lock. They've actually straightened some of this river out here. Um, and right over in the back, again, just to show you the detail, there's, there's the mill complex here. And if I just blow that up a little bit, you can see people working on the lock here, for one thing. You can see a boat up by the mill. But just here, I don't think that you can see something on top of the roof there, look. I'll talk more about this in a moment, but that's a bell. And when the water here got too high, that bell would ring. And that's, that would tell the miller that the water's getting dangerously high and he needs to open the floodgates. Or he needs to start milling and open the sluices to the water wheel. Um, but yeah, and that's, that's still there, that, that little bell. There's, um, so we've, we've just walked down the towpath here. Um, there's two views of the lock. This has been fully restored. So this is um, one of only a couple, really, two or three that are actually fully working at the moment. Um, but there's a view of that. And if you keep going down this path beyond me just a bit further, then you have this lovely rear view of Flatford Mill. Although you can't really see it from here, but that bell is up here um, on there. And in this little um, place here, 
sometime around 1850, they installed a massive iron water wheel. It, it was, they reckon it was the biggest water wheel on the River Stewart. It was something like, um, you know, 10 foot in diameter, and a, no, 10 foot across and about 12 feet in diameter, a massive, massive thing. But this is also one of the only seats at Flatford where you can have a, if you've got a little group or some friends with you, you can all sit there at the same time. And that's where we, as in this picture here, it's a good photo shoot opportunity if you want to do that. But here we've got this cutout again, showing this giant water wheel installed sometime between 49 and 62. And there's the bell, spoke about earlier. So if that bell was to ring, the miller would come and open these floodgates here and let some of the water out. Um, or he would start the wheel going, open up the sluices and the wheel would, and it would come away that way as well. So there's some of the highlights really of the Flatford. And um, it's, it's a good idea if you can get a few pictures or postcards, you can go into the shop beforehand and buy a few little postcards of these scenes. And then you can, you can stand there and look at your postcard and look at the view at the same time. When you're finished, of course, depending how you come, you could walk back to Dedham across the river. Um, you can get a boat. Some people will hire us just off to the right. There's some boats. You can hire a boat and row your way down to Dedham and the bottom here. Look, there we are arriving at Dedham. So you can either walk or you can get in your car and, and drive that way. We're going to get in our car. We're going to um, leave Flatford Mill and we're going to head just about a mile and a half away to East Burgol. Now, it's, it's a one way system if, if you know Flatford Mills. I mean, just as well, because it's such a narrow lane. But as you leave Flatford Mill and you're heading for East Burgol, you'll come to a place where you climb fairly high up, very high up. And when you get to the top, the road bends around to the right. And on your left is a little place to park a car. Um, if there's a car already there, you've lost out. But if you can, if that's empty, you're going to pull in there. And if I was taking a coach, I used to get the coach driver to stop briefly because you can look over Dead and Vale at another one of Constable's paintings. And it's this view here, the Stewart Valley and Dedham Church. And this is the exact view you can get if you can get on that little pull-in just at the top of the hill before you go around um, right on the way to East Burgot. And there's Dedham Church here, which you can see. Moving on, so you'll come out of the lane and right in front of you is St Mary's Church at Dedham. And again, this was another painting that Constable completed. So wherever you go, um, you know, Constable was there before us. And this is Constable's view. You, you can see the trees were overhanging the roadway quite a lot in Constable's time. And um, here it is. I mean, Constable painted this um, numerous times or, or drew it, um, pictures of it. Um, the interesting thing about Burgholt Church, of course, is that it didn't have a tower. So there's, there's no tower there. Now, there's lots of stories as to why there's no tower. Um, they didn't start, part of the problem was they didn't start building it soon enough. <laughs> a lot of the church was remodeled in the 15th century, but they didn't start the tower until 1525. They dead and finished their tower in 1520. And you can imagine them looking over the valley and seeing this lovely tower at Dedham, and that's something that they wanted. So they started the tower about 1525. And according to one theory, Cardinal Wolsey, who lived at nearby Ipswich, was helping to fund the tower. Now, he eventually fell out of favour and died in 1530. So the funding dried up, if, if that's where it was coming from. Another option, of course, it might have just been too expensive. You know, in the 1520s, um, Henry VIII brought out several taxations for the whole country and they may not may not been able to afford it and this was getting right to the end of the big church building period but but anyway um if you depending on when you go there to Dedham and to, to East Burgot Church you may still hear the real of the the peal of these church bells ringing out and they sound lovely but of course they're not ringing out from on high because there is no tower for the bills to burn. We'll see on the next picture where they are. Now, again, if you go around the back of Burgot Church, which we have here, over on the right-hand side, there is the temporary bell cage. So the bells, five of them, 
were put in this cage. This cage was built in 1531, a year after Wolsey died. The funding stopped, and this was supposed to be a temporary measure. And we and we we know that's a temporary measure because as, as late as 1541, we have records of people leaving. Um, one person left 110 marks, that's over 73 pounds, to finish building the steeple, as they called it. So they were still expecting to finish it, but of course they never did, and this became a permanent structure. Although interestingly, it used to be over here on the east side. And the people who lived in the hall opposite apparently complained about the noise, so they had it moved around the, the other side. Um, also, if you're here, just out of the picture on the right, you can see where Golding Constable and Anne Constable's mother and some of the other Constable family are buried. They've got a big tomb there, which you can see. But also just here, almost on the corner here, look, um, there's another grave. And that is the grave of William Lott from Willie Lott's house. And it tells us here, look, that um, he died on the and July the 12th, 1849, aged 88 years. And it says he resided at Gibbons Farm um, near Flatford Mill in the, of this parish all his life. So that kind of suggests he lived at Gibbons Farm, but that's um, not probably quite the case. But anyway, it's, it says that he hardly ever left Flatford. He might, may have left Flatford no more than three or four times in those 88 years. But um, anyway, let's have a close look at this, um, this bell cage. Now inside this um, bell cage are five large bronze bells. Um, together they weigh about four and a quarter ton. And they're the heaviest set of five bells in England. There we are, so that's in, inside here. Now when I took this photograph probably, this was back in the, probably the 1990s, I can't remember what time of day or what day it was, but all of a sudden I was standing there taking a few pictures and all these people on cycles came cycling into the churchyard, propped up their cycles against the church and here, opened this door here and they were the bell ringers. They'd come to do their practice. So I thought, my, this is interesting. I'm gonna have a look and see what happens. Now, if we look at this image inside, there's the five bells. Now the bells are always left upside down, so the cup is sticking up in the air and they're, they're balanced. And I'm, I'm probably simplifying this enormously, but what seemed to happen, um, five different people, one stood at each bell and they released some sort of catch here. And one of them would just push his bell up. All you have, because they're, they're balanced, you've only got to give it a slight push. And the whole thing will swing round and they catch it when it comes up this other side. And of course, they push it back again. It swings back and they catch it on the upright. And of course, every time it does that, it peels the thing, you know, the, makes a noise. And because they do it in synchronized, so, you know, somebody here will do his bell, then him, then him, then him, then him, then him. Then him and the whole thing put together sounds miraculous. If you haven't heard it, go along either on a Sunday morning, maybe, or when they do their bell ringing practice. Here we've got an image from probably the 40s or the 50s um, showing them actually ringing the bells. And although there are other bell cages in England, in fact, we've got a, a nice little one at Radness, but these are the only bells that are still hand rung without any mechanical assistance, um, if we can put it like that. Um, this is um, courtesy of the Colster History Channel Paul Diggins went and did some filming there and these are the the more modern bell ringers um, standing at their bells and giving them a, a push in in either direction. There's plenty of signs inside um, obviously only people who are doing the ringing are allowed to go in there and all persons entering do so at their own risk um, but even so that didn't stop um, a major problem um, Go back one. Didn't stop a major problem in September 1999 when um, a bell ringer who was giving tuition to a young lad um, got his hand caught in the bell and the young lad had his arm broken. And what the result of that was, the health and safety executive were called in. They, they sealed up the bell cage. No more bell ringing. 
the bells were swung down so they're in their normal sort of lowered position and we thought that's the end of it because you know the the parish council were obviously worried that you know someone's going to sue them could sue them for millions i mean it's it's what we call nowadays a foreseeable risk you know if you're going to swing a bell that weighs over a ton and put your hand in and out it, you know you should know it could cause you an injury so what happened um, between 1999 and 2001 is that they did certain work they had contractors in carrying out alterations safety work to satisfy the health safety executive and then i think in 2002 they started ringing again so the, the bells are now back ringing again just before we leave um east Burgholt, there's the church here look what i try and do if you come up from flatford around here i try and park here somewhere there's usually quite a bit of space you can sometimes stop a coach there for a, a brief period if not if you keep on going into the village there's a proper car park but if you park here there's a few things to see so there's the church opposite the church here is Stuart house uh, this was formerly the home of randolph churchill son of the wartime prime minister and if you walk along here just a bit further up here you'll see the site of the former constable family home where john constable was said to have been born and there's a little plaque on the the gate here further up in the village you can see john constable's little studio that he used to do a lot of um, painting in and he used to spend a lot of time with a, um, a friend of his called john dunthorne john dunthorne the elder he was a, a local plumber and glazier but he was also a keen artist and he and john constable used to go out sketching together and you can see dunthorne's little house and dunthorne's son um, johnny junior um, he became constable's assistant later on later went to london and worked in his studios and just opposite here the, the, there's a little village green and the village the the little sign for the village green is the bell cage so we're going to move along from east burgol and we're going to come to our final little part of um constable country uh, which is dedham now i just want to quote you a couple of words you've all heard of nicholas pevsner the historian and when he was in his Essex edition, um, when he was talking about Dedham, he said, Dedham is easily the most attractive small town in Essex. And he also said, there's nothing at Dedham to hurt the eye. Now, I think that's true. That This is um, Dedham in 1832. So it looks quite quaint. The, the, the church dominates, the grammar school dominates. This was a, a sort of large square here where they used to hold the market. And the modern view, yeah, similar. That's the view that, that we have today. Um, very, very popular. Whenever you go there, you're, you're kind of be tripping over tourists, but it's, it's, it's such a nice little place to go. So many things you can go down by, by the river as well. If we just go a little bit closer, we can look at, it, this is the main street. Can't show you at all. Lots of quality houses. Dedham was a centre of the cloth industry, like Colchester was uh, early on. Lots of people made um, a lot of money in the cloth trade. And they were able, although many of these buildings aren't old timber frame buildings behind, many were able to put nice Georgian fronts on. And we'll talk about this one in a few moments' time. The building here, the Essex Tea Room, which is now owned and run by um, Wilkinson's um, from Tiptree, the jam people, nice little place to go, but that's called Mill Lane. And if you go down there, that will take you down to the river. So we're going to go down there first and then we'll come back to the high street um, a bit later on. So just before where I'm standing on the right hand side, that's where the big car park is at Dedham, so you can park there. But this is the what well, this is the old mill. It's been converted into apartments and flats and everything now, and lots of bits added on. But this was the mill. This wasn't the same mill that Constable painted, but there's been about three mills here. But that's certainly one of them. But if we go around the other side and look back towards the church, here we've got Dedham Lock and Mill painted by John Constable in 1820. It's a bit difficult to get this exact view. Um, like we have done with some of the others, but it's quite an interesting. Sometimes, in, on some of his paintings, he, you often see Dedham Church in the scene, but on some occasions, it's not actually in the right place. 
it's like he's moved it a bit to help compose his picture if you like but look there's the mill um there is the lock so there's a lock you can see there's a barge coming through dedham lock it's about to come through here out into the mill pool and then it will make its way up go under the bridge and off to flatford mill um there's the sluices you can see the there's a big mill pond behind here the river's built up obviously because they need a head of water for that and you can see the sluices coming down here even today you can still see some of these features if you if i just show you this um, google map for a moment so there's the high street we started off from that's where the church is that's mill lane that we walked down okay and this is the mill complex and there's the the river stewer coming down here there it goes down the sluices here into the big mill pond and there's the lock and if i just show you that a bit larger look you can clearly see the lock here now look there's the lock keeper's cottage and this lock has been restored but they've got problems with it. the gates need replacing again apparently but there's the road that we walked down so the road goes we can just see a bit of the road going around here then the road goes over here look and just here somewhere there's a little, where these trees are there's a little footpath where you can walk along and you can walk along a little footway over the sluice over the lock and come to this field so that's something quite interesting as well and this is um the, the view so as you start walking along the footpath right behind the mill you can see the sluice is here and there's a couple of outfalls here and the lock well that is a bit overgrown but the lock would would come out into this pond here and of course if you you walk along further you walk right across here so there's the sluice and there's the lock um which is again it's um it just all adds to the experience of of constable country if, if you know um where to look now i just want to talk briefly about these barges i'll call the barges or lighters um I said generally they would be in pairs, so they'd be coupled together, and they would be towed along the towpath by a horse. And there'd normally be another man, or usually a young boy perhaps, who'd be looking after the horse. If it's a young boy, he might even be on the horse's back. And they, to get to, now the, the actual navigation starts at Missley or Manningtree and goes to Sudbury. So that's the steel navigation. And originally, that's where they all you know they went right from the keys at Missley right up to Sudbury and back again and the distance is just under 24 miles so about 23 and a half miles and it would take about two days to get there this is a horse walking up the towpath and um it would take I say about two days it was 13 hours downstream coming back and about 14 hours going upstream and each of these um barges could have a cargo weighing um 13 tons yeah 13 tons so if you double that up that horse is pulling about 26 tons along now on a on a road on the old poor old road system that we had although a, you know a horse could carry about two or three hundred weight uh, it might be able to pull a cart weighing about a ton but these horses are pulling 26 tons or or more now the problem was the towpath they couldn't keep on the same path on the same side of the river because in in certain areas the farmer who owned the land he might have lots of sheep and cattle grazing and he doesn't want the towpath there and he and he wouldn't give permission so they had to cross the river to go over on the other side so it was a constant it, it wasn't just starting here and walking up one side and coming back down the other side they would often have to cross over from one side to the other um, to get to a, a towpath that they were allowed to walk on and um, altogether between Missley and Sudbury they had to do that 33 times so the horse and the boy had to cross the river 33 times there wasn't many bridges so what they did they put the horse onto one of these barges and boated him across to the other side now that sounds quite easy but you try getting a horse to jump off firm terra firma onto a slightly moving boat that's probably wet and slippery it took a lot of training 
to get those horses to give them the nerve and the training to actually step into the the well part of a barge although they might put straw down to help it and then they took it over to the other side and the horse would have to jump out again and even if they were walking up the same path farmers fit even if the farmer allowed them on his side he still might have fences up because he wants to keep his stock in so the horses had to jump over the fences and between Missley and Sudbury they had to jump 120 fences these horses so what a job and some of these fences were at least three feet high um, it's been said that the Stuart Navigation horses must have been the fittest and strongest of all the canals in England. Not only did they have to pull this 26 tonnes, they had to cross over the river, 120 jumps, um, working all day long. So bear that in mind, let's have a look at a, another image. This is near Wormingford Lock, about 1900. And there's a little fence, not a very high one, but the horse you can see here has come along this pope line and he's leapt across to over there. And um, don't forget, you had to do that 120 times and cross over the river 33 times. Um, Constable, of course, looked at this. He would have observed what was going on. And at least two of his paintings, he incorporated that into the view. And in this particular image from somewhere between Flatford and Dedham, you can see Dedham Church again here. I'm not sure whether that was literally in view, but he put it there. But there we've got a horse. It's called the Leaping Horse Look. And this time the boys sitting on it, whether the boys would have sat on it, it might have done, or that, I mean, they could have fallen off, obviously, but the there's the horse that leaping over one of these 120 boundary fences. And another view back at Flatford Mill, we're, we're looking at the, that, that is Willie Lott's house from the back, but we can see this is the white horse. Um, the barge has just come through Flatford Lock. It's on its way down river. Uh, the, the towpath finishes here. So the, the horse has had to step onto the barge and what will happen, the barge now goes into midwater and he'll float downstream a little bit out of picture and then he'll jump off on the left bank and then make his way down to Brantford, Brantham Lock uh, on his way down to Missley. So, yeah, it's, it's quite, it's a lot more to that than um, meets the eye really, these, um, had these barges were moved around. Let's go back now to Dedham High Street again, briefly. And um, I want to talk a bit about this building here. This is called Sherman's or Sherman's Hall. And um, I'll show you another view. There it is. This is Sherman's. This was, um, this was built. Um, it, it's an old building, probably from the 16th century. And um, it was given in 1601 under the will of Edmund Sherman as a school for the village children to learn to do their to learn to read and to write basically basically the three R's and um, opposite over the road we'll see in a moment was the grammar school where John Constable attended where they were taught the classics but this was really for, um, for, for probably children aspiring to be tradesmen rather than going to university and um, they, they would be taught to read and write. In fact, Thomas Boggus, who became a famous bay maker in culture at the Minories, um, his father sent him here as a, as a day pupil. Um, so, but in the 1700s, about 1730, 1731, this was given a, a big makeover. They, they remodeled some of the inside, but they also put on this amazing Georgian brick facade, which stands out amongst all the houses in Dedham and I'm not quite sure how they did it well what the whoever designed this has managed to incorporate about three of the classical orders into one facade here if you look at the side you've got these large giant orders brick orders of Doric architecture here so that kind of frames the front you've got a, a, tim a wooden door case which has got Corinthian columns or pilasters so we've got Doric, we've got Corinthian, and in this niche here, we have Ionic columns or pilasters. So we've got Ionic, Corinthian, Doric, all mixed into the same facade. So this was a school, this was a school right up until about 1873, I believe. And if you, if you look at walking on the footpath, 
Notice also, like many Georgian houses, um, you know, think of holly trees, many, many of them. You go up steps to get to the door. They, they raise it up a little bit, and that gives, that helps to get light to the basement areas, which you can see here. But if you, if you look on either side, on this brickwork, either side, as, as far as a child could reach, you'll see lots of graffiti. This is from here, look, just that bit there. And it's almost, it's almost as over, I mean, some of this must have taken a bit of time to carve all this. It's almost like the teacher sort of <laughs> turned a blind eye. It was almost like a, a tradition because you've got it on both sides. Um, and someone has said that they can, there's a, a, a JC here as for John Constable, but he didn't actually go to this school. So that's probably somebody else. Um, the Shermans, of course, Edmund Sherman, as I said, who gave this in his will, but many of the Sherman family in the 1630s and 40s went to America. Um, they, they settled at a place which they eventually called Dedham in Massachusetts. Uh, they become quite famous. The, one of them was a, a signatory to the, uh, the signing of the act of, um, um, uh, the name escapes me, Independence Charter. Um, W.T. Sherman was a hero of the Civil War. Uh, so you, you get a lot of Americans who are Shermans come back here because they're buried in Dedham Church as well. If you do a 180 degree turn while you're standing here and you can look across at the grammar school, now, this is where John Constable attended. Um, this was also built, this was built circa 1730. Certainly this part was, because there's a date on there. This might have been a fraction earlier, about the same time as Sherman's, and probably the same builders, almost certainly, because it's very, very, very similar. This is what is now called the old grammar school, but this would have been the headmaster's house. There would have been dormitories up here, but that would be the headmaster's um, study, probably here, and his room there. Um, and this was mainly where the students were. There was also dormitories up here. And in Constable's day, there would have been another building on the end here as well. So there was a, a block of three. Now, as I said, Constable came here, but before he came to Dedham School, when he was seven years old, his father sent him as a boarder to Lavenham. And he hated it. But if you go to Lavenham now and they take you on a tour, you'll, they'll probably almost certainly stop here. Um, a couple of years ago, I took a group from the grammar school boys on a tour um, of Lavenham and I lined them all up over the road here. And I was standing here talking to them and one of these windows opened up and it was a lady who lives there. And once she knew they were the grammar school boys, she was thrilled and she was telling them a little about, a bit about the history of the house. But if you read down here, this is about Constable. He was removed to a school at Lavenham, the master of which, being in love, left the care of his scholars to an usher, who flogged them so unmercifully mercifully, as to incur the hatred of them all. From Lavenham, he was removed to the grammar school of the Reverend Dr. Grimwood. So his father could obviously, John, was um, terribly upset here. So he brought him back um, to Dedham, and that was the best thing that happened to him. He spent... Um, you know, a few years here and the master there indulged him in his painting and he was happy. He, in the summer months, they had to start at six o'clock in the morning. So the, the grammar school opened at six and they, the students had to work till five and Constable lived two miles away in East Burgol. So he would have to walk from East Burgol across the, across the water meadows over the river uh, to get here by six o'clock. In the winter, they put it back to seven and they finished at four. But just to show you in Constable's day, this was what it used to look like, the block of three. So they believe this one was the, this was the, um, the first part, then that one, and this was already there, so that buttered up to it. This was taken down in the 1920s. And I want to finish um, our little tour talking a little bit about the church. Now this is open to the public. Um, virtually all the time but if you go in there like now this week or next week you won't be able to wander around the whole building because of covid you can walk in a little bit but you you won't be able to go and look at everything but uh, this was built as you can see here from between 1492 and 1520 1492 of course is the when columbus was supposed to have discovered america um, i'm sure it was there before he got there but um 
and they finished it about 1520 and of course that lovely great tower the people of Burgholt were looking over the meadows jealous I should imagine um, they, they didn't have one like that then one of the things about Dedham and many other towns and communities um, around the country after the Reformation in particular as you got towards the Elizabethan period um, they the the feeling was particularly with this sort of Puritan movement coming along was that people needed to have God's word preached to them this is something that the the clergy before the Reformation hadn't really done in fact most ordinary parish priests were probably not very well educated they probably wouldn't have been able to do it and um, what they basically spent their time doing was um, you know the various sacraments they had to do performing those even after the Reformation um, although they had to read from books of homilies in other words they, they had to read sermons out um, to the congregation it's not it's not the same as personally preaching to somebody so there was a great need that people needed to have the word of God spoke to them so people started hiring lecturers or town preachers Colchester had a town preacher for a hundred years it was called the common preacher and Dedham had their first one in 1577 Edmund Chapman he was the first um, lecturer and Dedham actually still has one it, the, the local vicar or rector is the ex officio um, lecturer but in the days in the past and in particular in 1605 a lecturer called John Rogers was given the position of lecturer and he stayed there until he died in 1636 many of these these lecturers were academics and, and from our neck of the woods they mainly came from Cambridge so they were educated and they could they could preach that's what they were paid for and Rogers and the other lecturers were basically paid to do two things they were paid to teach Sunday school or catechism on, on a Sunday and to teach or to preach a weekly sermon that was their job to assist the vicar if you like or the rector and the the weekly sermon was given at eight o'clock on a Tuesday morning and the reason why it was on a Tuesday morning because this was market day and in the large square just almost to the right of where these gates are now that's where the market took place the market opened at nine o'clock and everybody attended the sermon the lecture and John Rogers was one of the best he was called Roaring Rogers that was his nickname and he was a real fire and brimstone preacher you know they say he, he would grab hold of the pulpit scream out at the parishioners take them to task for not reading their Bibles tell them that your Bibles are covered in cobwebs and dust and and uh, you know God's God's watching you he knows what and but people loved it they used to get congregations every Tuesday morning of at least a thousand and many academics would ride over on horseback from Cambridge just to hear Rogers there's another time when the Bishop of Norwich was on a visit um, to his diocese in Ipswich and he sent his servants to hire some post horses and he couldn't hire one because they'd all been hired out for people coming to see Rogers and sometimes it said that when it was a fine day and there's two, lots and lots of people he would stand up and you see a little turret here he would stand on this little turret and preach to as many people as he could in the open air at the time of his funeral it said there were so many people crammed into the church at least 1200 in fact just before that before I go on to that um, so halfway through his sort of reign because he was so many people flocking to hear him they had to install galleries extra seating for another 300 people or so right across the western end of the church okay now when he died these the whole church was packed the galleries were packed as well and they they thought there were so many people there they thought the galleries were going to collapse and I'll, I'll just show you this but this is um this is a quote by an eyewitness who was at John Rogers funeral it was at Mr Rogers funeral that there were more people than three sets churches could hold the gallery was so overladen with people that it sank and cracked in the middle where it was jointed the timbers gaped and parted one for another so there was a great cry in the church they under the gallery fearing to be smothered 
those that were upon it hastened off in some way or another and some leapt down among the people in the church i don't think there was actually any injuries but that's um, part of the legacy of dedham and if you go into the church now now you go in through the the north porch there's the door okay now before we go in here can you see this door is cut this is an original door can you see it's been sawn all the way through here because when they put the galleries up they couldn't open the door because the galleries were in the way so now the galleries aren't there now they've obviously been removed but so that cut was because the galleries were in the way and, and if you go through here and we'll, we'll use this side now straight ahead of you you'll see a constable painting on the wall now if you'd have visited Dedham Church 20 odd years ago, there was just a, a doorway there. There was actually a doorway there and there was no stairway or anything. And you people used to wonder, well, what's the door there for? Well, of course, that was the original doorway up to the gallery. Um, that's how you got up to the gallery. But um, apart from doing his landscapes, um, Constable Lawson, I mean, just about his landscapes, although his landscapes now sell for 20, 30 million pounds, some of the landscapes he painted in his day didn't actually sell straight away. Um, they were more of an indulgence, um, really. And like many painters, John Constable did a lot of portraiture work. So he would, he would paint someone's portraiture for, say, 20 guineas or something like that. And he said to have painted at least 100 portraits. You know, if you wanted a copy of yourself in Constable's day, you couldn't go down Pronto Print or somewhere. So you had to, but someone had to paint you. So Constable did a lot of portrait work. He did his landscapes, of course, but he also did three religious paintings in the form of altarpieces for the churches. And this one here, they've put that there. I'll just show you a better view of it. This is called the Risen Christ. And this was originally commissioned for Manningtree Church. And it's, it stayed in Manningtree Church until the church was pulled down in 19, eight, yeah, 1965. It was then purchased by Fearing Church, and it, it, it was in Fearing until um, about 20 odd years ago. Um, the church at Fearing were in desperate need of some money for a new central heating system. So they decided to sell the Constable painting. And what actually happened, the, the people of Dedham got together a little society together, Constable Preservation Society, etc. And they managed to raise, to cut a long story short, about £70,000 to buy this painting. And where do we put it? Let's put it over the door, where the doorway was. So that's where it hangs now. In fact, this was in 2001. By the end of 2002, it was on an exhibition sent off to the Grand Palais at Paris for a big exhibition. So anyway, this was one of three religious paintings. They normally would have been behind the altar as a form of rear dos. Um, he did one for Brantham Church. This is Christ blessing the children. This is now currently on loan to Emmanuel College in Cambridge. And on the right, Christ um, blessing the elements or Christ blessing the, the bread and wine. This was commissioned by Constable's aunt. Um, for Nayland Church and it's still there and you can still see it in Nayland Church although a few years back it was stolen from Nayland Church and they, they managed to get it back again and now it's behind glass and there's a very sophisticated alarm system so you, you can't go further than the rails if you like to have a look at it but um, if we look down the, the body of the church um, this is looking down the nave. If you go right, if you, you can't walk here now because I've blocked it off. If you go right down to the bottom of the nave to the chancel here, there, and look on this wall, um, you will see uh, against this window here a bust or a little model here of John Roaring Rogers. So this was a sort of fashionable style of things they used to do in those days. Also, one more thing to mention in the church, if you if you look down the right aisle, the south aisle it would be, there's lots of these tablets on the wall. Um, this one here is quite interesting. Keep your eye open for that one because that's this one here. And it tells us here, it says Judith Eyre, wife of Joseph Eyre, many years of this parish, who died much lamented 
in the 35th year of her age, January 24th, 1747 stroke eight, in consequence of having accidentally swallowed a pin. So that's interesting. You imagine that was your ancestor to know that. You see, if you were to look in the church registers, Darien, Dead and Burial Regis, 1747, there she is, Mrs. Judith Eyre, wife of Joseph Eyre. That's it, nothing else. You have no idea how old she was, no idea how she died. So always have a look. There could be something, a grave marker, or even something in the church that can give you that extra little clue. And finally, as we leave the church, that's the way we come in. This is where the galleries were. The galleries would have come right across here. And on the way out, if you look at this column here in particular, in fact, there's, there's columns both sides, but and there's some here, but this column in particular, if you look up about eight or nine feet off the ground, which most people won't be looking for, you'll see more graffiti. This is all graffiti, dates, initials, names. These are probably the grammar school boys sitting up in the gallery listening to a long sermon or something and whiling their time away. They did it on their school building or the boys over the road and they did it on the church as well. So that's where I'm going to sort of stop. If, if you'd like to find out more, I can highly recommend these three publications by Ian St. John. There's one on Dead and one on Flatford and one on East Burgholt packed with information, lots of illustrations. And I'm going to finish with another lovely little view of the river at Dedham. Um, this photograph was taken by my wife, Christine, and um, it seems that all the cows decided to have a drink at the same time. The picture's taken from the bridge. Um, but this is where I'm going to leave it. So I hope that's been of some interest. And that's where we're going to stop. Thank you very much.